Welcome. Good morning. <laughs> we gather this morning as God's beloved children. No matter how glad we are or how tired we are or how out of sorts we are this morning, regardless of whether we've had a bad morning or a good morning, we come together as people Jesus calls as community. So this place becomes a place of welcome. I'm thankful for a God who accepts us for who we are. He's eager to have a relationship with us. So much so that he sent Jesus into this crazy, messed up world for each of our salvation. I'm so thankful for that. So we've come to give him thanks and to praise him, to be with others and to sing and to learn. And I invite you to stand as we worship. Oh 
what the Lord God says the creator of the heavens who stretches them out who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it I the Lord have called you in righteousness I will take hold of your hand I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the peoples and a light to the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and the new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song his praise from the ends of the earth.
Please be seated. Time for devotions. Exodus. Excellent. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground. Turn into a snake. Oh, and, and um, this, said the Lord, is, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, he was leprous like snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second, but if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Not very inspiring, God. Oh, Lord, what am I supposed to get out of this? Hello? Oh. God? <laughs> no, 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 this is Ben, right? You, you're, you're pulling my leg. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. It's God. God, I, you know, I was just reading your word. It's a great book. Yeah, I know I said it wasn't very inspiring. Sorry about that. I... Oh, well, I was, just, I was just thinking about Moses there and him going, you know, Moses, great guy, God. You picked a real good one there. I mean, he was, he was a powerhouse. What a guy. That Oh, shepherd, yeah, yeah, murderer, yeah, yeah, not such a great guy, maybe, yeah. Well, I was just reading about him, and, and there he is, he's in front of the burning bush, and you're talking to him, and man, what it must be like to have God talk directly. Oh, yeah, right, you are, okay, uh, okay. Uh, well, anyway, I was just wondering what I'm supposed to get out of this, and and. Right, right. You were sending Moses to Pharaoh. You were getting your people released. Yeah, right. You had a job, right? I get that. You want me to do something? God, I'm no politician. I don't think I can deal with Pharaoh. I, please don't send me to Putin. I, I don't know what I would do with that. No, no, no. I, I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm listening. I'm listening. Well, yeah, there are ministries in the church that we could, yeah, I know, I know there's lots of stuff that can be done. I, sure, yeah. Oh, I really love the going to church and listening to the music and, well, yeah, I could probably participate in that stuff. I, oh, but God, I can't, I can't play the, the keyboard like Josh or sing like Jess. I mean, I, what am I going to? Well, yeah, I can sing a little bit. I know I sing in the shower. Sorry, I sing in the shower all the time, right? I know, I know. You want me to sing, really, in front of people? Well, yeah, 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 I know, I know. Somebody's got to do it, right? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't sing off key, do I? It's all right in the shower, isn't it? All right, I'm listening, I'm listening. 
but, but I really don't like getting up in front of people. Lord, I, you know how that is. You get up in front of people, you get all nervous, your palms sweat. I, I know, I know. You, Moses said the same stuff. I, I get it. I get it. But, well, yeah, there are other things that can be done. I mean, yeah, there's the computer and the soundboard. The soundboard looks really complicated, God. I don't know. I, that, that's a lot of switches. Yeah, yeah. Reagan, Alex, they would teach me. Sure, sure, yeah. You're right, you're right. And, but, but it is an awful... The computer? Oh God, you know I don't like computers. I, you know, they, they don't like me. I, yeah, I use one at work all the time. You're right, God. I, <laughs> but I'm not very good. I Point and click. Yes, I get it. Drag and drop. Okay, yes. Yes, God, I, I hear you. I hear you. But God, are you sure you want somebody like me back... I mean, what if, what if I'm back there and I'm doing all this stuff and then I get distracted and I don't worship? You, oh, if enough people did it, I wouldn't have to do it every week. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But God, you know, I, all this technical stuff, all this musical stuff, I don't know. Yeah, I'm listening. The kids? What about them? Well, yeah, sure, I love kids. I mean, they're great. I mean, you, you make the cute little things. They're awesome, God, I, I know. You want me to teach them? Well, God, I don't know if I can do that. I'm no teach. Yeah, I think I am probably smart as a fifth grader. Yes, God. <laughs> but then they miss the service, and they have to go to the Sunday. I know, once again, yes, God, you're right. If I don't, if, I, if enough people did it, I wouldn't have to do it every week. You're right, you're right. God, I, I, I don't know. I, isn't there somebody else? That, I mean, there's great people doing this stuff already. Isn't there somebody? Read, read the, next, the next part. Yes, yes, all right. Ah, oh, my, my eyes go. Yeah, well, I'll put it on speaker. No, I won't put it on speaker. Then the Lord said, if, if, if they do not, no, not that part, okay. The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth, who makes, makes him deaf or mute, who gives him, but Moses said, oh Lord, please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burnt, burned against Moses. God, you're not mad at me, are you? No, no, I, I didn't get that impression. No, but that's what you had me read. And Oh, I see. Moses just kept pushing back. And, and after a while, I see. I see. Well, God, I, I'm sorry for saying your word wasn't inspiring. It certainly inspired me today. I don't know. I, I got a lot, a lot out of it with a good teacher. <sighs> that's all? Okay, well. I'm going to give all this a lot of thought, God. I, I, I'm going to do that. You bet. Oh, no, you don't bet. No, no. <laughs> all, all right. Uh, well, well, thank you. I, I appreciate the direct word. Appreciate that a lot. Hello, operator? Was that Colette? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want to dial star 69. I had enough of that. <laughs> I had enough of that conversation. All right, thank you. Oh God, you have given us these two very large ministries. Children's ministry, what some have called the biggest force of volunteers in the country, people who teach children Sunday school. Worship ministries that is so inspiring, God, that we hear the music that you give to us, and, and, and it takes so much. And just sitting here right now, God, I, I can count ten people involved in, in bringing worship to you. 
knowing that it is a big job and, and sometimes it can be challenging, but God, teach us what it means to accept a challenge in your name. Father, I pray that you would raise up for yourself from this congregation this morning a handful of people, maybe two, to minister to children and to do worship ministries. Father, let us not shrink back because we're shy or we feel inadequate or we feel unprepared or, or we feel ill at ease. God, help us to overcome the personal inhibitions that keep us from doing the things that you'd like us to do, knowing that you will grow us into what it is that you have for us to do. Father, we worship you this morning in song, alongside the children. We bring you offerings. We pray. We listen to your word. Father, please bless the offering that's accepted this morning. Use it, we pray, to do great and mighty things. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers can come forward. Some weeks back, I invited you to give me verses that are especially meaningful to you and said that we would be taking messages out of those verses for the coming year. Many of you did that. I, I received over 40, um, over 40 suggested passages. Believe it or not, not one duplicate. I, I'm still impressed with that. I, I thought there would be. This week is the first 
of those passages. And we're going to be covering them uh, as, as we go through the year. For this first part of the year, up through just about Easter, it amazed me how many passages had to do with the character and attributes of God, His personality and, and who He is. So for the first part of the year, we're going to be covering a lot of material that has to do with that. I think we have a children's program this morning. I, they, they didn't leave already, did they? Okay. All right. That makes it easy on me. I remembered, right? So this morning, we're looking at Exodus beginning with chapter 33. And, and this story is not the story we read a few minutes ago. This is a different story. This story gives me chills. I kid you not. What kind of audacity it takes to stand before God and say, I want to see you. I mean, it, it's tough enough to think about Moses talking with God person to person, but it's even harder to think about the idea that God actually did it. He granted his request and allowed Moses to see him physically to, to a degree which, which is big enough, and that's what Moses wanted, but God did more than that and revealed his inner self, revealed his personality and his character. Rabbis call the statement that we're looking at this morning the 13 attributes. It shows up often in the Old Testament in bits and pieces and adapted to different circumstances. At least nine times you can find it in, in the Old Testament. In Exodus, Numbers, Nehemiah, three times in Psalms, Joel, Jonah, and Nahum. And maybe there are more. I didn't, I didn't do a deep dive on that. I just did uh, a very surface kind of survey. And a comparison of these expressions of the same idea is interesting in itself, but we're not going to do that kind of a broad sweep. Today, we're just looking at the first one, beginning in Exodus chapter 33. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and the herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first and went up on Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, Yahweh, and passed in front of Moses proclaiming, Yahweh. Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. 
In the rabbinic breakdown of this passage, some of God's attributes are explicit and some are implied. And I think that that traditional breakdown is a little forced in some ways, but they break down each trait into fine nuance. And either way, no matter how you approach it, this is a veritable catalog of God's greatness. His name, repeated twice, implies mercy to those who have not yet sinned and those who have what the rabbis would call two different kinds of mercy, compassion, grace. God, a second name of God, implies power, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness. That is, the rabbis would say, intentional sin, rebellion, willful sin, and sin, which they would define as error. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. This is a big picture. And the statement that is made here becomes a formula in the Bible for systematically understanding God. I break the passage down differently than, than our rabbinic friends. Let's take Moses' approach. God, how would you describe yourself? And in his answer, I see two big ideas. First, love. Second, wrath. I want to take the second one first. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. This is a strong statement of the wrath of God. When he gets angry, he really gets angry. God is very literally saying... Just pay attention to it. He's very literally saying, I'm going to smack you so hard, your grandchildren are going to hurt. If we divide this statement into two, we might have different reactions to it. He doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. We very clearly in that phrasing hear God saying, I am just. And that probably Sounds like a good thing to us. I like that. If a person callously harms me, I might hope that a judge will bring justice. With some infractions, everybody in the world hopes a judge will bring justice. The first part of the statement might be reassuring because people get away with things all the time. Crimes go unsolved. Criminals get off with a slap on the wrist. But God's going to take care of all this. He promises right here. His justice is perfect. He sees the whole picture and every variable. Heaven and hell are the ultimate expressions of God's judgment and His justice. But as we keep reading, we go, God, how should I take this second idea, this generational impact of your justice? It's easy to think that that doesn't sound just at all. To make a child pay for the sins of his parents? But I want you to think about this for a few minutes on, on a massive scale, the natural laws of cause and effect. If a parent does not properly care for a child, that's sinful, no doubt about it. And the child is not at fault, but the child will be affected. He may grow up with emotional needs because of his parents' negligence. He may be physically hurt by undernourishment. And the list could go on. In this way, the sin of the father is, in fact, visited on the son. It's a proverbial idea out there that if a person suffers abuse, they are more likely to abuse. In that way, it isn't a stretch at all to think that the sins of a parent are going to be visited on the grandchild. Substance abuse, it works its way down a family tree so that if my parents or my grandparents were subject to substance abuse, I'm more likely to be subject to it myself. And, and think about it on another scale. God sometimes judges nations who oppose His will, and that often lasts for generations. In the biggest picture, God's actions are historic. They're global. Not a personal scale. We read the book of Ruth and we see this, this great exception to the rule where 
a, a nation, the nation of Moab, is judged by God. And it's one of these generational judgments where, where they may not for generations enter into, enter into the assembly. But, but Ruth finds a way in. And she experiences God's grace anyway. And I really believe that this statement is that kind of truth. Think about the book of Nahum. He expresses Moses' formula in a different light. And he emphasizes God's justice and wrath. He says in Nahum chapter 1, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. This is the only time in all the different expressions of God's identity that the phrase abounding in love is not present. God's patience in the book of Nahum is at a point of no return in the sense that God's global judgment will in fact affect future generations. He does visit the sins of the parents on the children. In another way, though, we have to see this on this infinite scale that God is working with. We come back to that patience mentioned early in the book of Exodus. God is not just a knee-jerk God. Before Nahum ever said this, Jonah visited Nineveh. He gives chance after chance for repentance. In the end, though, he can also see when an attitude or behavior is so embedded in the culture, it's going to continue to corrupt. And he knows as the great physician when the only answer is surgery. At the same time, he sees the dilemma of this policy. Later, God expresses in a different way how restoration intervenes in this policy and how God himself adjusts it. In the book of Jeremiah 31, just as I watched over them to uproot and tear down, and to overthrow, destroy, and bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. God's wrath is not indiscriminate. When there is hope, He pinpoints His judgment toward the guilty, and restores the rest. But wrath is not the bigger part of the picture in this identity of God. Let's look back at the original question. God, how would you describe yourself? And in the bigger expression of what God says about himself, he describes love. Look at all the expressions of love in this statement. Compassion, grace, slow to anger. Abounding in love, faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiveness of wickedness and rebellion and sin, without even trying to parse out the nuances of what these different expressions of love mean, we can see much more of an expression of love than wrath. God tempers His wrath with love. One statement is mentioned in all nine of these expressions of, of, of God's self-identity. Slow to anger. Slow to anger. It appears all nine times in the formula. God is patient. With, with the Amorites, as he's talking to, to Abraham, his patience lasts 400 years. With the Israelites, as he's talking to Abraham, we, we learn that his patience is going to last 800 years. We look at our society today. It's filled with decadence. Violence. Greed. Sexual perversion. Selfishness. Arrogance. Unrestrained appetite. Cruelty. Apathy. And we wonder sometimes, why doesn't God do something? Because he's patient. 
We think a just God would act, but we're thinking on our own timetable. God is patient. And His patience is an expression of His love. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're glad He's patient. Because we know what we do that's massively messed up. And we're glad that God doesn't unleash His judgment immediately. Almost as often mentioned as His patience is the abundance of His love. God does not just love, He abounds with love. He overflows with it. He demonstrates it in a multitude of ways. All the expressions of love in this varied statement demonstrate the depth, the width, the height, the duration of His love. He is compassionate, He says. And when we're hurting or in need, He sees that and He empathizes and He extends His help. He brings us healing and nurture both in body and in spirit. For me, at least this year, things were pretty rough last year. But He brought me through it. I give Him thanks because there's nothing that I could have done to make sure that would happen. It's only because of God's compassion that I'm still standing. He is gracious. He gives us favor that we don't deserve. We sin and He treats us with kindness. What does Jesus say? That God sends His rain, and today He's sending us a good bit of it, on the just and the unjust. That's His grace. It's like a birthday celebration. All we have to really do is survive for another year and everybody makes a fuss about us. God makes a fuss about us when we know that we're just dusty, faulty people. He is faithful. He is faithful. When God commits, He doesn't give up on us. His patience keeps coming back to stand with us and support us. He created us so He knows our limits better than we do. How many times have I pulled away from God over the years out of temptation or depression or frustration and He always brings me back? And He offers that love freely to everyone. He says to thousands. Nobody is outside the purview of God's love. Nobody is outside the purview of God's love. Say it with me. Nobody is outside the purview of God's love. Say it louder. Nobody is outside the purview of God's love. You are not outside the purview of God's love. That person in your life that you're wondering about, they're not outside the purview of God's love. That person you've been praying for for decades, they're not outside the purview of God's love. That person who treats you badly, they too are not outside the purview of God's love. He died for the whole world There is no sin that God cannot forgive. There is no ruin that He cannot restore. Uh, Tim, what about the unforgivable sin? Yeah, we'll get on to that another day. He is forgiving. He says that right here Himself. He forgives. He treats willful sin and persistent rebellion and moral mistakes all the same. He mercifully washes it away and starts new with us. It's an expression of His faithfulness. He does not abandon us when we stray from Him, when we fall into or back into sinful habits, when we momentarily pursue things that we shouldn't, when we give in to our weaknesses. We all do it much more than we really would like to admit. But He forgives us and He brings us back. God is slow to anger, abounding in love. His justice and His judgment, they're real. His wrath is real. And the Bible makes that abundantly clear. It should cause us to fear God, but not to the point that we become bitter or paralyzed or resigned to it. Because when God passed in front of Moses, revealing Himself, not just in physical form, but in His personality and character, His love is what He emphasized. His love is what He described in fine detail. 
I think that God declared His wrath second in this particular moment because His love takes priority. His default position is love. He will resort to judgment and wrath after His loving patience is exhausted. After years, decades, sometimes centuries, He finally gives in to His anger, but He will exercise love first. You know, even the trouble that we experience sometimes is an expression of God's love. And maybe you'd like to say, hey, you know, I don't want that expression so much anymore. That, that's... It may feel to us like judgment, but it's God shouting in our ear to come back. He says in the book of Hebrews, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. And your hardship is discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. God's overwhelming love is the most compelling reason that I can think of to be a Christian. We all fail. We all fall short. We all need compassion and mercy. We deeply need to be loved on a level that no person could ever fulfill. We're designed that way. It's in our makeup. Also, God reaches into our need as Christians to remind us of who He is. I know I feel the need for God's love on a regular basis because I certainly don't love myself sometimes. You see, God says that He purposely chooses to dismiss the memory of my sin when He forgives me. And I don't do that. God's character is huge. It's complex. When he asked, he boiled it down to two major features, love and wrath, with a priority on love. Wrath tempered by patience and forgiveness. With all the misrepresentations out there of who God is and how he shows up, it helps us to remember how he describes his character. I love you intensely expressed in a multitude of ways I punish severely but I'd rather forgive and God will patiently wait for us to catch up with that reality
Given the supposed weather today, I was thinking a little bit about snow. A couple of weeks ago, I was supposed to uh, lead worship, and the snow kept us from meeting together. It's kind of like a snow day. As a child, I loved snow days. I remember staying up late or, or uh, getting up early, really, really early to see if it had snowed, see if we were going to have school. So before showing my age, before the internet, before the phone, the cell phone, you would go to the news to see if, if school was canceled. And sure, there was a phone number that I could call and I could find out right away. But for some reason, I loved to sit and listen to the radio. And they would list off this long, long list of schools. And I would just wait and wait and wait to hear mine. There it is. Then I knew there would be a day of sledding and shoveling and walking in the snow, maybe going with my parents for a ride in the snow because I love driving in the snow. Fun. I love snow. I think I've said that before. Yes, I even enjoy driving in snow. I know, that's very strange. <laughs> I especially like it while everything is still fresh and white. It's a glistening blanket over the world. So the Bible doesn't mention snow very often, but it does mention it. One time is found in Job. In chapter 37, it says, God's voice is glorious in the thunder. We can't even imagine the greatness of his power. He directs the snow to fall on the earth and tells the rain to pour down. Then everyone stops working so that they can watch his power. Then everyone stops working so they can watch his power. It's a snow break. God wants us to take a snow break, but to be reminded of him and 
what he can do, his power, his power. In a snow day, our routines are messed up. We get disrupted. We have unexpected changes. Maybe we end up having a little extra time off. So next time, let's use a little bit of that time to consider God, to consider the greatness of his power who directs the snow to fall on the earth. He is faithful, he is good, he is slow to anger, abounding in love. He brings the snow, he's in control of the weather, he's in control of our jobs, he's in control of our lives. Let's take time to remember him and to praise him for that. Now I want it to snow again. We'll see if it snows. I invite you to stand as we continue worship.
says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raises us up with Christ and seated, with, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work so that man, a man can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Grace, it is the gift of God a wonderful and amazing gift. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. you've done for me.
yes, I sing for all that you've done for me. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. May God's amazing grace and love be evident to you throughout this week. Go in peace.